Thank you. We're, this is our official start. I appreciate your joining us for our webinar tonight. It is the third in our series of webinars attached to uh, the Claudia Miller Ignite series on animal welfare. We appreciate uh, the sponsorship to do this. Today's topic is helping animals by influencing the farm bill, the four key provisions that will make a difference. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, animal wellness action first before we go too far into it. You've no doubt learned a little bit uh, since you've uh, subscribed uh, to this webinar or signed up for it. Uh, maybe some of you are already receiving our news alerts. So Animal Wellness Action is a 501c4 nonprofit. We promote laws, regulations at the federal, state, and local levels to target cruelty to animals. We work for the enforcement of existing anti-cruelty laws and wildlife protection laws. And we believe that helping animals helps us all. Now, we also have a sister organization, the Center for a Humane Economy. It's a 501c3. Through the Center for a Humane Economy, we work on influencing businesses. So we have Animal Wellness Action, working on the state or the federal and the local issues legislatively. And then we also have the Center for a Humane Economy, which works with businesses. So you may have seen that uh, we had some success recently when our pressure to Nike to stop selling shoes made from kangaroo leather uh, uh, helped contribute to help contribute to that corporate uh, decision. So, so those are our two angles. Uh, you can subscribe, donate, and follow us at animalwellnessaction.org. The Center for a Humane Economy.org uh, is the place you can go to for that, um, uh, that series of newsletters and to learn more about us there. We are a nonprofit. We do exist on donations. And I always take this opportunity in the webinar series to ask you to consider adding us to your philanthropic mix. Uh, we have great programs. You can donate monthly to us very easily. Uh, we are a very frugal, lean, mean, animal welfare fighting machine. In fact, not too long ago, I said, Wayne, I need some post-its. And Wayne said, Joe, just get, get some, some index cards and some gum. That'll work. That's how frugal we are. So your donations go a long way towards helping us uh, advocate for the animals. Here's how today is going to work. Questions can be entered into the chat and will be answered toward the end of the event. We do have a few polls we'll throw out. If you hang on till the end, you'll get the answers to those. We'll send out tomorrow a link to the recorded version. You'll be able to watch it, share it with your friends. If you have to leave early, we hope you don't have to, but you'll be able to watch the entire event on our YouTube channel tomorrow. If anything occurs, or if you have any questions that don't get answered, this is my email address, joseph, animalwellnessaction.org. Be sure and reach out to me so that I can uh, get back with you and answer any questions that didn't get answered today. Here's the run of events. The Farm Bill, what it is and what's at stake. We'll talk about ending the slaughter pipeline, putting the final stop to greyhound racing, cockfighting and the Fight Act, and then finally wrapping it all up because we do put the action in animal wellness action, how you can help get things done. I won't go uh, in depth into the introductions until we get to the segments where the individuals will be speaking, but Wayne Pastelli, Animal Wellness Action, our president is with us. Rebecca Keat and Siri Lindley, Horses in Our Hands. Carrie Thiel, Great 2K USA is on the panel with us as well. And we hope that we're able to resolve uh, technical difficulties with Steve Hindy before we get to that uh, component of the conversation. He's uh, sh with Shark, showing animals respect and kindness. Let me go right now to, uh, to Wayne Pacelli. He is the president and founder of Animal Wellness Action and the Center for Humane Economy. Uh, he has helped pass uh, well over a thousand ballot initiatives, various laws, uh, published two New York Times best-selling books on animal welfare. Uh, and if you follow our content at all, you certainly know Wayne. Wayne, let's start off with you and let me uh, ask you to give us a little, little bit of context about the Farm Bill and what uh, we are really looking at when we talk about it. Well, Joseph, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining. Great to be with all of you. Thank you for tuning in. 
Uh, the Farm Bill is an every five year legislative package that focuses on a wide variety of issues dealing with agriculture, food, nutrition, uh, land conservation, and the like. That doesn't have anything to do with animals, it sounds like, except in that commodities often involve the use of animals like pigs and chickens and, and cattle. The Farm Bill is in the jurisdiction of the U.S. House and U.S. Senate Agriculture Committees, and the Congress divvies up its work based on the jurisdiction of each committee. So the Agriculture Committee uh, really oversees the U.S. Department of Agriculture and all the things that USDA does. One of the things that USDA has responsibility for is the Federal Animal Welfare Act. That's a 1966 law that has been amended many, many times uh, in the last 50 plus years. And anything that touches the Animal Welfare Act in terms of a legislative proposal, a bill, gets assigned to the Agriculture Committee. Now, typically the Agriculture Committee is constituted uh, with members of Congress, again, U.S. representatives and U.S. senators from the more agriculturally oriented states. So basically, you know, there are two, both senators from Iowa are on the Senate Agriculture Committee. And you can look at the committee overall, and it has more of a rural representation. That's typically not a great outcome for animal welfare. And the committee is not instinctively drawn to address animal welfare issues. In fact, independent of these farm bill issues, the Agriculture Committee hasn't in the last 20 years conducted a single hearing on an animal welfare bill. It's not conducted any oversight. But every five years, this farm bill, which is this melange or amalgam of disparate provisions related to agriculture, food, nutrition broadly, gets done. So it's called a must-pass bill. So we have written a number of animal welfare bills to amend the Animal Welfare Act so they are germane to the Agriculture Committee and that can find a home on the farm bill. So Joseph, the answer is, it's a little bit of, you know, kind of complicated process in the Congress, but we're looking to hitch a ride for some of the animal welfare provisions that you enumerated, the animal fighting bill to strengthen our laws against dog fighting and cock fighting, a ban finally on the slaughter of horses for human consumption in the United States and also American horses shipped to Canada and Mexico, and also a ban on greyhound racing. There's also a hugely significant issue that I want to touch on this evening a little bit later, and that is something called the EATS Act, which is a defensive effort that we're going to have to make to block an effort to unwind Proposition 12 in California, which was a landmark farm animal protection ballot measure. And similarly, Amendment 3 in Massachusetts, also a sweeping farm animal protection measure. So Joseph, the Farm Bill is a big must-pass bill, was last passed uh, in 2018. So it's now 2023, five years later, and the prior bill expires on September 30th. So the deadline for Congress is to complete work on the Farm Bill by September 30th. Now, the reality is they're probably not going to complete the work and they can extend that perhaps to the end of the year, perhaps even into next year, but we've got to be ready for this first deadline. And that means that yeah, it's coming right around the bend here. So July is going to be critically important on all these animal welfare issues. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Wayne. That's a nice setup for the rest of our conversation this afternoon. Ryan, do we have poll? Yes, we do. All right. What's our first poll of the night? Launching the first poll right now. On your screen, you should see a poll that asks you, do you think America is heading in the right direction for animal welfare? You can click either yes, to some degree, not really, or no. And again, we will reveal the results of these polls at the end of this webinar. All right. Good deal. Inquiring minds want to know, Ryan, as they used to say. So yes, to some degree, not really no, is America heading in the right direction? All right, I appreciate that. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, and um, does that stay on or can I go ahead and, and just click out of that if I'm, I'm ready to go? I guess I can just click out of that. So uh, uh, before we get to our first uh, pair of guests, 
uh, we have a short video we'd like to show to set up the topic of horse slaughter. So I'm going to share my screen, get the audio on that. And then as soon as we're finished uh, watching that video, I'll, I'll introduce our guests and they can take us through their presentation. Let me just, Joseph, let me, before we get on to, to Beck and Siri, let me just say a couple of more things. So I, I again, um, am, am really excited about the possibility of imminent reform uh, for the United States on animal welfare. Uh, this is a tough slog to get legislation done in the United States Congress, uh, but it is so important. You're going to hear tonight about horses, you're gonna hear about dogs, you're gonna hear about chickens, you're gonna hear about pigs. And the thing that unites all of these different animals and all of these different problems that confront the animal protection movement and really uh, subject animals to, to so much pain and misery is that all of these animals, all of them, uh, they have the same capacity to suffer and to feel pain. You know, a lot of people try to diminish animals. Uh, they say they're different from us. They're not as smart as we are. They can't compose a sonnet. Uh, they can't, you know, equip an army. There's all sorts of things that humans are so distinctive in uh, doing. We have incredible intelligence, creativity, innovation. But animals, non-human animals, are, are equals when it comes to pain and suffering. And they are subjected to enormous threats from just a wide range of industries. We raise animals for food and we imprison them on factory farms. Uh, we subject animals to testing and research for science. We exploit them in wildlife management for fashion, uh, for use in sports, spectator sports and the like. We at Animal Wellness Action and the Center for Humane Economy are doing our best to tackle these large scale institutional forms of cruelty. And we do it with our partners. And tonight we've got several great partner organizations you're gonna hear from, uh, whether it's uh, Great 2K or, or Shark or uh, our friends back in Siri with, with um, uh, please remind, I'm blanking on- Horses in our hands. Of course, horses in our hands. I had a, I had a, I had a, a, a brain freeze. Horses in our hands, which is one of so many outstanding horse protection organizations. But we're partnering with these groups because together we can take on these enormous problems for animals. And we need all of you involved in this effort. I'm so glad that you're participating on this Zoom call tonight because. We can't do it alone. You know, I am on Capitol Hill all the time. My colleagues are advocating for animals. Uh, Beck and Siri are operating now from California, and Steve is in Illinois, and Carrie's in Massachusetts. But we need literally millions of Americans to raise their voices on these issues. If this was easy, someone else would have done this before. And I am absolutely convinced that the American public is with us on these issues. Cruelty to animals is accepted 
as a problem in our society and opposition to animal cruelty is a universal value. The problem comes in application of these ideas. How do we logically extend anti-cruelty principles in a world where animals are used in so many different ways? I mean, to me, it's unimaginable to have stage fights between animals. It is unthinkable to kill horses for slaughter for human consumption. It is a horror to put pigs in a crate where they cannot turn around. And it is archaic to race greyhounds and have them suffer so many injuries on the track. To you and me, these are very logical conclusions about these inhumane and barbaric, sometimes barbaric activities. But our emotions and our feelings are not enough to achieve change. We've got to take action, directed action. And we at Animal Wellness Action, I think, have the most strategic understanding of how we're going to get these issues over the finish line. And we're going to build these partnerships with the organizations on this call and hundreds of others to try to have sweeping change for animals. So I just want to tell you again what our context is. I mean, I love animal rescue. I think it's so important. You know, today a bird flew into our house, a pileated woodpecker, and got injured. And we rushed that poor little woodpecker to the to the wildlife uh, rehab center in DC called City Wildlife. And you know, it was just heartbreaking. It was just awful. But if that's what we restrict our work to, which is responding to animals who are injured and in crisis, we are never, ever going to address the fundamental problems for animals. We need to prevent cruelty on the front end. We need legal standards to protect animals from misery and pain and harm. There is such an asymmetrical relationship between humans and animals. We hold all the power. We are the lords of the animals. We control their fate. People harm them for whim and for profit and for tradition, all sorts of things that are not justified in this day and age. But we also have the power to turn around these problems. We need to be the force that overcomes these terrible traditions, that overcomes greed. And that is really what we're all about. But we've got to channel this work into legislative activity. And that's what the Farm Bill offers us the chance to do. So Joseph, I'm sorry to, to, to delay the introduction of, of Beck and Siri, uh, but I just wanted to give us a little more context in charging ahead tonight. Muted. Yeah, so Joseph, you're muted. So let's let, yeah, there you go. Okay. Anyone that wants a refund on this webinar, you just let me know. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll send you a, a refund. All right. I do want to introduce with great pleasure, uh, Siri Lindley and Rebecca Keat. I've gotten to know them on a lot of our calls and they're just dynamos. Uh, they're both former world champion athletes who have turned their inexhaustible energy to helping horses. They founded Believe Ranch and Rescue and have personally saved 300 horses from slaughter. They launched Horses in Our Hands to lobby for a federal ban on the horrific practice of horse slaughter. They live in California with their 17 rescue horses and are bringing their expertise to this forum when it comes to on the ground horse rescue, fighting the horse slaughter pipeline and helping their followers and ours and now you learn how to navigate legislature to get the safe act passed. So Beck and Siri, I'll turn it over to you and when you're ready, I'll have your PowerPoint, fingers crossed, ready to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph and Wayne. Um, beautifully stated. Thank you so much to AWA, the Center for Humane Economy, um, each and every one of you that are on this webinar. Thank you. That's the first step in making this happen. You know, when we, um, about eight years ago, um, became aware of what was happening to horses as far as how they were being transported for slaughter um, and the horrific conditions and you know many many of them being dismembered alive when we became aware of this thanks to the work of people like animals angels um we knew that we just we couldn't sit back knowing that this was happening and so in those eight years we've saved 300 horses 
from slaughter. But we reached a point in 2019 where just like Wayne was saying, we thought all we're doing is putting a Band-Aid on this massive problem. And we realized that as many horses as we were saving, we, we just couldn't, it wasn't sustainable. So we created our second nonprofit, Horses in Our Hands, which is a 501c44, <laughs> thank you. And um, our main goal was to raise awareness, to help everybody understand that number one, this is an issue, this is a problem, this is the truth of what's happening to our beloved American horses. And in raising that awareness, having people like you taking action, sending letters to legislators, you know, like showing up at auctions and educating the people that are going there and letting people know what's actually happening so they can get on board and they can act. This is what's needed. We need each and every one of you to act. Um, we're going to get more into that, but I'm going to leave it to Beck with our first slide, Joseph, if you might. But I just want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight and Wayne for making this possible. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Siri. Thanks, Wayne. Thanks, everybody, for being on this call. Uh, so as I won't double over on what Wayne said, but as you know, in 2007, uh, there was uh, an introduction of defunding uh, USDA inspections, which meant that horse slaughter plants in the US are closed down. Uh, unfortunately, it's not permanent every year that defund language needs to be reintroduced. Uh, it's gone through the House, I believe, and we're still waiting for it to go through the Senate. But unfortunately, as you also know, there's a huge loophole that now exists. And unfortunately, horses are now being shipped in horrific conditions uh, to Mexico and Canada. And we're here to, to try and stop that. So we can go to the next slide, Joyce. Yeah, so the lives that have been lost, more than a million U.S. horses have been shipped to slaughter in foreign lands over the last 20 years. Due to public awareness, which has been our main goal uh, at Horses in Our Hands and lobbying in DC along with these great groups, um, the numbers have decreased over the last 10 years from over 100,000 to 19,000 in 2022. And the year to date, uh, 6,767 horses, still way too many. Um, as of March 2023, 598 U.S. horses were shipped to Canada for slaughter. And as of June 22nd, 6,169 U.S. horses were shipped to Mexico for slaughter. And it's in Mexico, especially where we have seen the footage of horses, you know, being dragged off the stock trailers, unable to move, still being dragged into the slaughterhouse, pulled up by their back legs and given a botched uh, bolt to the head, which doesn't kill them, but having to uh, go through six to seven minutes of being dismembered alive. It's just absolutely horrific and this must stop. Okay, we can go to the next slide, Josie. Uh, you guys probably know of a lot of the, the myths that exist and the main one that always comes up for us is uh, what about all the unwanted horses? Uh, the unwanted horse myth was created by pro slaughter groups, which we will mention later on, uh, Big Ag and uh, some other some other groups that are against horse slaughter. And the truth really is that there are thousands of rescues like ours, Believe Ranch and Rescue, that exist across the country uh, that can absorb these horses at auction. And uh, even though slaughter was uh, closed down in the 2007, uh, the number of horses has decreased. The number of horse ships should have decreased, not increased. So that's proof that each year the number of horses being shipped is is being reduced. And then we we also hear a lot of um, uh, stuff being thrown around social media. Another big myth is that um, what about the sick and emaciated horses? And we go to auction. We're on the ground rescuing, uh, and we can vouch for at least in Colorado, uh, ninety percent of these horses, if not more, of the horses that we have saved are young sound horses and the kill buyers are sitting there prying on these horses because they want the young healthy meat for these European markets. And uh, we also see other rescues along with us are perfectly good um, 
uh, forever homes and um, children, kids, uh, private buyers that sit there and are constantly being outbid by kill buyers. And and the second myth, which uh, we know has also been um, a big one that the American Veterinary Association and AAAP have brought up is that it's a necessary, it's humane euthanasia, they, they have described it as before previously, or it's a necessary evil. Uh, and again, that's another myth that's been brought up by, the, by those big groups that are, that are pro-slaughter. Um, the truth is that horses, uh, and you saw that video and that um, probably didn't quite do it justice, but we took the graphic parts out. Um, they go for several days without food and water. We've seen Animals Angels has, has just released, um, which we can also share later on, um, a report that shows they suffer for days, two or three days, if not more, without food or water, put into a truck with horses they don't know, uh, being kicked and beaten um, and often coming off either, um, you know, severely injured or dead. And uh, that report will be available uh, after this call, hopefully, for you guys to see. So it's absolutely barbaric. And these are the myths that exist. So if you want to take a screenshot, you guys. You. So the road to horse slaughter, um, Beck and I, as we said, are on the ground. And we have witnessed uh, the horses that show up at auction. And they are 92% they've found are healthy young horses. Yes, there are the ones that are sick and we save those. And rather than sending, sending them on a five to seven day trip in an overcrowded stock trailer, we sometimes just bring them home so we can give them humane euthanasia so they can be you know, out of their pain. But basically what happens at the auctions, the one in Colorado is a centennial livestock auction, Kill buyers outbid the good homes like rescues and private buyers. I can't tell you how many times we have been there on the ground watching families and their children crying because they cannot pay the price that the kill buyer has lifted the bid to. These horses have homes. These horses have people that desperately want them, but the kill buyers just, they are lurking and they will up the price. Fortunately for us, um, we just go in there saying that we will not be outbid. We will make sure that we get that horse no matter what, but sometimes we end up paying $2,500 for an old sick horse. It's a game to them. And it's just, there's so many homes that are there wanting to take the horses in, but they simply can't outbid the kill buyer. Purchased horses are held at a feedlot, which very often, at least the one in Colorado, very often they have no food, no water, and strangles on the lot. Oftentimes they get sick. Um, many mares have foals on the kill lot, and when the stock trailer comes to take the horses to Mexico or Canada, the babies are left to fend for themselves as the mares are loaded. Um, oftentimes those um, babies die at the kill lot if they're not saved. A full load, um, it's typically about 30 to 50 horses, um, which is way over what should be fitting in the size trailer that they're being sent in. Um, the horses, once they are loaded into the stock trailer, head to either the Mexican border or the Canadian border, they take their time in extreme heat, in freezing cold weather, they are in this, stock trailer two to seven days crammed into these trucks no food or water animal angels and others have found footage of horses dead on the ground having been trampled to death it is simply disgusting slaughter bound horses are easily identifiable here's the thing if we can create uh some things to look out for at these borders um, slaughter bound horses typically are loose in the trailer, no halters, injured, obviously suffering, no food or water, and many are wearing auction stickers. In 2022, about 1,500 horses a month or 30 to 50 stock trailers are taken across borders for inhumane horse slaughter. Okay, let's quickly jump onto the next one because we now have a lot to get through. This is the second last slide, you guys. Uh, just so you guys that aren't aware of uh, the pro slaughter groups, and um, we take say, don't say this lightly because last year the reason why the bill uh, did not go out of the subcommittee was because of these pro slaughter groups. American Veterinary Association, American Association of Equine Practitioners, these are just some of them, Cattlemen's Association, Sheep Association, Quarter Horse Association, tribal groups, and there are quite a few more also to, to be known. Um, and let's go, let's go through the last slide because I think that's the most important one is what can you do? I'm sorry, the second last slide, what can you do? Um, 
this is where if you look at animal wellness action on social media or horses in our hands we're asking right now for you to identify if you're in these areas it's really important that you take action by either calling these numbers we will also send the link out you can just simply go to uh, horses in our hands bio link you can email these legislators if you're in this district it's really important for you to go to these reps these are republican reps in the ag committee that we are getting them to push on uh Chairman Thompson to include the SAFE Act. So there are calls to action. And of course, in general, it's just bringing awareness, right, Siri? Just to bring each and every one of you, the more you can share what's really happening, you can inform people before they drop their horse at slaughter. You can, if you hear of somebody taking their horse to slaughter, call us, call any other rescue. We will make sure that we find a better place for that horse mm -hmm. than landing in the slaughter pipeline. This is all about sharing what you know, raising awareness, sending letters to your legislators. So while we wait for the work to be done legislatively, at least let's build the awareness so fewer horses are ending up in danger. And if you want to follow us, um, we'll just quickly put up our, our uh, social media handles and our email. Feel, honestly, feel free to, to email us. Um, we will always answer every email. Personally, uh, we do most of the stuff um, hands on ourselves. And, and again, we want to thank Wayne for holding this. Um, sorry we had to rush through, but uh, we really hope that was educational for you guys. And one last thing for all of you. I know people will say, well, this is imperfect. This is wrong with what you're proposing, or this is let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, okay? This needs to stop. Let's save as many horses as we possibly can. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's been 20 years. It's been 20 years, so don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Horses are obviously in our hearts and their lives are in our hands. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Wayne, AWA. We appreciate you. Thank you. Oh, listen, I'm, I'm going to jump in if I might and just thank you guys for the incredible dedication to the horses. I mean, you're both super spokespersons for our cause and you're on the ground, you're helping these horses, you see the pain of the horses once they're funneled into the slaughter pipeline. You're both absolutely correct. This bill has languished for years. It's actually longer. It's been 25, 25 years since I first saw a bill introduced in Congress on horse slaughter. Now, you guys were correct. In 2007, we got the U.S. slaughter plants shut down. And that was a combination of state action and federal action. But as you noted, we've got to stop these live exports going down to Canada. 80% of the horses slaughtered, American horses that are sent to our North American neighbors are going to Mexico, the other 20% to Canada. This farm bill is going to pass this Congress. We know that we've got a majority of senators and representatives in favor of the SAFE Act. And we have bill numbers on our website, uh, Horses in Our Hands website as well, and social media platforms. So this is different. This is different. We need to give this a push. And you mentioned some of the lawmakers. Those are just a few of the key lawmakers. These are Republicans who are in districts who should be with us on this issue. Almost all the Democrats are with us on the subject. And a lot of Republicans are with us in the Congress, but we have a few key targets. And I'm thankful, Beck and Siri, for your identifying those individuals. And again, this is just the start of our dialogue with all of you. So we want to be engaging with you. And if you have ideas, if you want you have energy, you want to spend on this, if you want to commit to this, we're going to get this bill done. So Joseph, let me turn it back to you. All right, great. And um, uh, Becker, Siri, you had invited people to capture a screenshot. I'll send the deck out with the uh, video so that way all of the information can be gleaned from that. So if you're watching this, don't stress. I'll make sure that uh, you get all of that great information she uh, presented. Ryan, help us refresh in the palette with a nice crisp poll. Would you, would you do the next poll, please? Sure can. Right, this one is looking at each individual state, which all of you are from. Do you believe your state representative or state government is on the progressive side of animal welfare? Yes, to some degree, not really, or no. So last question looked at America as a whole. This time we're narrowing in on your individual state. All right, fascinating. A wily question there, uh, Mr. Ryan. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Again, stay tuned to the end. 
We have one more question to come in the poll. We'll give the results at the end. Right now, though, I want to pivot quickly over to introduce our next speaker. Harry Thiel. He is the executive director of Gray 2K USA. He has been sourced in hundreds of news articles about Greyhound racing and has authored guest columns about the industry, which have been published in dozens of media. He has extensive legislative experience and has testified in favor of stronger Greyhound protection laws uh, before legislative committees in multiple states. Kerry, thanks for being with us. Take it away. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Joseph and Wayne and the other panelists. It's it's truly an honor. Uh, you know, our work at Great to KUSA is uh, really uh, comes out of a grassroots movement that preceded us to end greyhound racing. Um, and over the last you know twenty five almost years, you know, we have. Uh, use the legislative process, the ballot initiative process, the electioneering process uh, to you know, fight for these dogs and have been very blessed to have a lot of success. Um, I do think our work is unique in that you know, we are you know, the only uh, effort in the movement, in my opinion, that's taking on established uh, economically significant animal use industry and seeking to completely abolish it through an animal welfare argument and winning. Um, but that, that uh, is, is not due to any ingenuity on our part. It's really just due to uh, a huge number of people who have fought for these gentle dogs and made incredible sacrifices and helped us fig figure out uh, along the way how, how to do this. Um, when we first formed, uh, you know, the animal protection community, quite frankly, was not enthusiastic about taking on this industry. And it was really, you know, Christine Dorchak and, and me and a few other people in a basement office that flooded, uh, you know, decades later, you know, we watched uh, a ballot question uh, pass in Florida of all places that not only shut down 12 operational dog tracks that had been at one time had done a billion dollars a year collectively in, in gambling business, um, but that measure passed with a 69% vote, a uh, higher vote total than Ron DeSantis, um, swept the state from one end of the state to the other with an incredible coalition that goes beyond bipartisan. I mean, it was, it was uh, you know, the left and the right together. So, you know, th th this to me, our work is is an example of how you really can make fundamental changes for animals. It's not theoretical. If you work hard and you're lucky and you can bring together enough people who care, you know, these changes really are possible. So, uh, Joseph, you, if you want to put up those few a few pictures, I just wanted to share with folks just to talk. Do you want about, the um, video first, Carrie, or do you want the two photos? You can do. Uh, the, the, I think the two photos first. Yeah, I'm gonna go through these very quickly. But um, you know, greyhound racing is is cruel and humane. Uh, just to briefly touch on some of the animal welfare issues, uh, this is uh, an actual uh, state injury report from West Virginia. Um, this is from just about a year ago, and you can see, you know, dog fell into rail, sudden death, sudden death, uh, tail puncture. 
seizure post race. Uh, if you see the 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 FX, that's that's fracture, a lot of broken legs, fractured hawk, fra fractured hawk, fra fra fractured hawk, you know, seizure post race. You know, th th this is just what happens on a daily basis in this industry. This is this is from West Virginia, one of the two remaining tracks. Uh, last year alone, there were 666, so almost you know, approaching 700 greyhound injuries in West Virginia, including 218 dogs that suffered broken legs and four dogs that died. So the, it's it's just a constant drumbeat of dogs being seriously injured at these tracks. You can go to the next picture, Joseph. Uh, also the dogs, this is how racing greyhounds live. They're kept in rows of stacked metal cages like this. This is again from West Virginia, from the two tracks that still exist. Uh, they're, they're kept in these cages perpetually, except a few times a day, they are turned out and allowed to relieve themselves. Um, and a few times a month, they're taken to the track to race. But other than that, literally, this is their life. They spend their life in a cage. Um, it's, it's just, it, it's no way to treat a dog. And, you know, one way I sometimes try to describe this to people is, if someone moved in next door to you and said, hey, I'm your new neighbor, I'm going to bring in a thousand dogs. I'm going to keep them in a warehouse style kennel and rows of stacked metal cages. They're going to live there most of their lives. Uh, but I'm going to build a track and every, every few days, I'm going to bring some of the dogs out. I'm going to have them race against each other so people can gamble on them. Some of the dogs are going to suffer broken legs. Some of the dogs are going to die, suffer broken necks. But don't worry, we love our dogs. Everything's great. Oh, and, and by the way, we're going to give all of our female dogs anabolic steroids so they don't lose any race days. And dogs are going to test positive for cocaine. And we're going to train some of the dogs with small animals, uh, allowing them to rip the animals apart. No one would be okay with that. Um, if someone tried to legalize greyhound racing today in any state in the union, um, they would be, you know, laughed out of the state house. Um, so the final slide I wanted to give, Joseph, you want to play the video? This is, it's, it's, it's relatively short, but I did just want everyone to, to understand what we're dealing with. This is a dog uh, named GF St. Saint, Saint, Saint Bart. This is in April of last year. It's a little grainy, I know. It was raining very, very heavily. Uh, this was at Mardi Gras in West Virginia. You can see here the dog falls, um, collides with, you know, collides with other dogs, falls, and keep going, uh, and the dogs continue racing around the track. So this dog, unfortunately, suffered a broken skull. And the, the really horrible, the thing that when I saw this, I, I literally gasped out loud because when you come back around, um, not only do you see track attendants uh, trying to help the dog, but you actually see a large pool of blood, uh, this huge pool of blood on the track. You know, this dog you know, broke his skull and, and, and literally uh, left the track just full of blood. So th th this is the reality of greyhound racing. It's, it's an industry that is built on the suffering and death of, of very gentle dogs. So uh, when we started this work, there were nearly 50 operational dog tracks in the United States. It was the sixth largest spectator sport in, in America, almost $4 billion wagered. Um, today, 20 years later, we are down to two remaining dog tracks, uh, both in West Virginia. The company that owns those two dog tracks wants to get out of greyhound racing. Um, the public has turned against this industry. The gamblers have turned against this industry. Um, even the track owners themselves have turned against this industry. And it, it really only continues to exist because of this very strange anti-free market state law in West Virginia, which says that uh, in order to have greyhound racing, they must by law race dogs, excuse me, in, in order to have other forms of gambling, they must by law race dogs, even if they're losing money on greyhound racing. And the same facilities must take about almost $20 million a year in gambling profits, like casino profits, and use that money to subsidize greyhound racing, which makes absolutely no sense. Um, so the federal bill, and I just want to say, you know, animal wellness is such an important ally of ours. We're so grateful to work with them. They are, without a doubt, our most important ally in this work. And, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that, you know, Wayne, the, the, the strategic vision that you brought to the animal movement generally has had a profound impact on, on us and our work over the years. Um, but, 
you know, when we started to talk about doing a federal bill, it was because all of the state legislation had happened first. And also, as Greyhound Racing is ending, we were starting to see foreign dog tracks come into the United States and start to appeal to American gamblers for the first time. And let me be clear, the fight to end greyhound racing has become one of the signature animal welfare debates across the globe. There are incredibly compassionate people fighting to outlaw greyhound racing in New Zealand, in Australia, in the United Kingdom, in Scotland, in, in Ireland, in Wales, all of the places where greyhound racing exists, there is an active effort to completely abolish this industry that is making progress. And the last thing we want to do is walk away from this fight and have America still be supporting those cruel foreign dog tracks. Um, there's a track in particular we're most concerned about in Tijuana, Mexico called Agua Caliente. Um, there are no animal welfare standards at all at that facility. Uh, the owner, uh, is not only an alleged cartel associate, uh, he's also an animal abuser in a bunch of other ways. Um, he's known wildlife trafficker, among other things. Um, and so, you know, to have a federal, a federal policy on this issue that not only ends greyhound racing and helps those, those you know, nearly 2,000 dogs are still right now sitting in cages at, at those West Virginia tracks, but also says foreign dog tracks cannot use the United States uh, to perpetuate their cruelty is going to be a huge moment uh, for not only the Greyhounds, but our entire movement. So, uh, you know, I will stop there um, because I know Wayne wants to, you know, later talk about the action piece of this, but I, I just want to say thank you. Um, that's, the Greyhound issue, and it's just truly an honor to to be here with so many compassionate people. Thank you. Yeah, I do want to chime in again, if I might. Uh, Carrie Teal is a very modest person, and so is his his partner in uh, Great 2K USA, uh, Christine Dorchak. They have, as a duo, single handedly or two handedly, uh, between the two of them. Uh, just change the trajectory of this issue. You heard him say 50 to 60 tracks a generation ago, about 60, uh, a little more than a generation ago, and now down to two in the United States. This is an incredible marker of our success as a movement. And if you don't think you can make a difference for animals, you know, with your dietary choices, with your other personal behaviors, with your political activism, also look at Carrie and Christine. They have made an incredible difference. Uh, they have done so efficiently, uh, not for, for fame or for money or any reason. And uh, it's really been just fabulous to work with them. Carrie and I have worked together since the 1990s. And Christine and I have worked together since the 1990s. And I'm so excited that this farm bill, we're going to finish off this industry in the United States. We're going to close out this problem in America. And it is a tough thing to shut down an entire industry. And we are on the cusp, but now we do not take our foot off the gas. We race through the finish line on this issue. So, Carrie, you, you are just such a fantastic advocate. And Christine and the rest of your team at Great 2, Great 2K USA, thanks so much for participating tonight. All right. Very good. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Carrie. Really do appreciate it. So far, we've heard about horses being slaughtered. Greyhound Racing. Steve Hindy is going to talk next about animal fighting, cockfighting in particular. Before I introduce him, uh, let me ask my colleague Ryan to present the third and final of our polls. Absolutely. Our third poll asks, who or what do you believe is the most prominent opponent to advances in animal welfare? Is it either corporations, antiquated social norms, politicians, or something else. You can feel free to post your answer in the Q&A if you believe it's something other than these three. All right, very good. Thank you for that. Uh, now, let me say just a word of introduction about Steve Hindy. Um, Steve is the founder and president of Showing Animals Respect and Kindness. Steve founded the Fox Valley Animal Protectors, which evolved into the Chicago Animal Rights Coalition, uh, which became SHARC, to document animal abuse and disseminate information about it. 
Steve and I have known each other for a long, long time. And uh, there have been times when he and I didn't see eye to eye, uh, but I always, always respected uh, his incredible tenacity and his courage. And now it's really been, it's really been a joy for me to uh, to unite with Steve in combating uh, staged animal fighting. And he is doing things that I could have never done and that Animal Wellness Action couldn't do literally every weekend. Uh, he is he is sniffing out uh, cockfighting derbies, fighting arenas where hundreds of people, sometimes 600, 800 people gather uh, for an evening or an afternoon or both an evening and afternoon of stage fighting between animals. And he's documenting it. He's droning it, calling law enforcement in. And Steve, I, I know you know you were you were attacked by cockfighters in Ohio. Uh, you were put in, in the hospital as a consequence of your confronting this, and you've made incredible sacrifices, and your team has. I've been so impressed with Mike Kobliska and the other members of your team. I just want to thank you so much for for fighting for these animals. This is a a little understood problem in terms of the scale. So so thank you very very much. You know, the, the the deal with cockfighting, and I'm I'm kind of assuming that people understand that these are birds that are specially bred, specially fed, specially trained to kill each other, uh, to attempt to kill each other. And they do so after they have razor sharp stabbing or slicing blades attached to their legs. Uh, this is already illegal. It's illegal everywhere in the United States, including U.S. territories. The problem with cockfighting can be put into four syllables, cops. The police in the United States, you know, it, 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 I just all I can do is shake my head when I hear anybody talk about third world corruption. I'm telling you, folks, we ain't got ain't nobody got corruption over uh, like we do. We've got corrupt police in this country that are protecting these cockfighters. And if we didn't have corrupt police protecting them, we wouldn't have cockfighting. Uh, certain places are much, much worse than others. Uh, Kentucky, I, I just can't say enough bad about Kentucky's police, ranging from the county sheriffs, with one exception, uh, to the state police. And in Kentucky, and for that matter, the governor. The governor knows what's going on. I mean, we've hammered him about it enough times. So you've got all the way from county law enforcement right up to the governor's uh, office. Uh, it, uh, they know what's going on, and they will not stop it. In uh, Oklahoma, another place where most of the sheriffs, uh, since we, they don't have state police in, in, in uh, Oklahoma, they have highway patrol. And the highway patrol is different from state police. So we have to rely on the sheriffs. And I, there I would say roughly half of the sheriffs are turning a blind eye. Some of them are, many of them are taking outright payoffs. Uh, Mississippi, awful, awful in Mississippi. Just two counties so far that we've been working on, Lee County and Tippa County. But those sheriffs of those two counties, it doesn't matter how much information we've given them, they will not make a bust. Same thing in Kentucky. So far, it's been pretty close to that in Oklahoma. So I'm welcoming the Farm the farm Bill, the FIGHT Act, because it should put more money into the hands of law enforcement. But what we need is good law enforcement. Right now, when a tougher law is passed, like in Kentucky, if they pass anything to try and bear down on it, the laws are poisoned to begin with. The cockfighters have enough support in the legislatures that they're that they're protecting these guys. They'll dumb down the laws. They'll weaken them. Because all the police do every time anybody tries to do anything is the police just get to charge more protection money from the cockfighters. So we need this fight act passed very, very badly. And, uh, and we need good cops out there, especially the feds. The feds are just overwhelmed with the amount of not just animal abuse, but so many of the kinds of corruption in this country. So we need uh, more good law enforcement. And that's what we're, we're, we're in 100% with, 
with uh, Animal Wellness Action's uh, efforts and, and Wayne and his crew. We're glad to be working with y'all and, uh, and we'll continue to, you know, we've been at it for three years. We're happy if, if it's gonna be 30 more, we, we, will not, we will not relent on these guys until they are not, not weakened, but absolutely eradicated. Steve, I, I I don't know if we have video. Joseph, are we going to show any video from uh, Shark and its investigations? It's been incredible that Steve Steve's a master of technology. He's got a fleet of drones, and he is taking drone footage of the cockfighters as they assemble. You can see their cars gather in a remote area around a barn or some other structure. And they're bringing birds into the facility, and oftentimes you can't see what's happening inside because the drone is, of course, you know, above the structure. But in cases where some of the structures have open sides, Steve has dropped the drone down uh, to get a view of what's happening. And uh, Steve, it's been it's been also remarkable to see you you and your team take undercover footage. I know I was shocked to see some of the cockfights that you infiltrated in Kentucky. And uh, tell us about some of the some of the spectators that were brought uh, into those cockfight. Uh, I'll answer your question, Wayne. I do have some video. Why don't I play the video, which shows some commerce or, or shipping of the birds at a post office? We have some uh, video of a cockfight, and then some of the aftermath. So, uh, why don't I let that roll while Steve uh, yeah. uh, give, gives his description? So, Great. give me one second to bring that up. And then Steve, uh, you can you can narrate or discuss as we go. Well, this is uh, Nathan Jumper. Uh, he he is delivering live fighting roosters to the U.S. Post Office. Now it is illegal to ship any animal for fighting purposes, but there's Nathan Jumper who owns a large fighting rooster farm, thousands of birds, and he is and he's dropping off live adult roosters. And you hear them crowing. They're not little chi little chicks that are just cheaping away. These containers are, are fighting roosters. You can hear them. The, the, the people at the post office know what's going on. They should be reporting it. Postal inspectors should be, you know, taking action and they're not. So again, it's another reason why this farm bill has got to pass with, with the, the changes that we need. Here, this is an actual cockfight. Uh, these birds have gaffs, what are called gaffs. They have razor sharp points on their legs. And when they strike at each other, they're literally, I mean, they're poking out eyes, they're stabbing, they're slicing. And as you can see, one bird is down now. This is probably the worst situation right now because when a bird is unable to, to fight anymore, it actually makes it harder for the other bird to win because he can't stab the same way anymore. So this bird, this, this fight could go on for a few minutes. It could literally go on for a few hours, hours. And once one bird is down, well, the bird that is dominating literally starts pecking out their eyes while they're alive. And, and, you know, doing all kinds of just any, these, these birds are bred to fight each other to the death. And as you can see, one can't even stand anymore. And yet they will put them back together over and over and over. If that bird is breathing, he's pretty much put back in the fight. Look at this. He can't stand up. He can't stand up yeah. and Let's they see. keep putting them back together. Yeah. Jo Joseph, let's, let's uh, cut the footage, but, oh yeah, let's go to this. This is uh, Steve. So this this fight occurred in, in Delaware, of all places. And these birds, these are birds that were brought out still alive after a fight. Uh, and these, these guys are so incompetent that they even have a, a tough time chopping a bird's head off. Yeah. And listen, it's tough to see. And, and you know, I, I'll, I, I gave Joseph and the, the go ahead to show this because it's a little it's it's almost a little distant, you know, with birds, you can't quite see the same level of suffering, but I assure you that these birds are suffering as much as any other creature. 
and Steve has documented this, right? We've got to tell the story because most people consider cockfighting a, a settled issue. They not only consider it morally settled, they consider it legally settled. And people have no idea about the scale of these crimes. Steve is on the road right now and he's going to a planned cockfight that he has gathered intelligence is going to occur this weekend and he's going to document it. And for as long as he and I have been working together, which has not been all that long, it's been just a few months that we really united to take on this problem. He and his team have been gone, I think, every weekend. Uh, I don't think there's been one weekend when he has not been uh, at a cockfight and trying to get law enforcement to act. Now, I think Steve has given you a, a, uh, a tough picture of law enforcement. And it's a sad truth that there are law enforcement agents who have sworn as law enforcement officers to uphold the laws of the state and the United States, and they're not doing so. I hope to God that they are a small minority of law enforcement. We do see at the same time law enforcement ignoring very clear intelligence that Steve and Shark have provided on cockfights in Mississippi and in Alabama and Kentucky and then a number of other states. We are seeing also arrests every week somewhere. In fact, I think the pressure that we have brought together in Oklahoma, there have been three raids uh, just in the last month in Oklahoma, which perhaps is the biggest cockfighting state. Steve and I uh, may have different views. He may think Kentucky's bigger. Sometimes I think Oklahoma's bigger. But the toughest states for cockfighting are starting to see action. The feds have hit uh, the Kentucky cockpit, cockpit several times. We're now seeing more concentrated enforcement activity. But again, if this was easy, somebody else would have done it. And I think what we're what we're talking about here tonight is taking on the three issues that we've presented to you are three issues that there's no serious-minded alternative position. It is despicable to stage fights between animals. It's unconscionable, as I said, to slaughter horses for human consumption. And it's archaic to conduct greyhound racing. We're talking about finishing these things off. And this is where the law has to speak. You know, when something is very popular, the law is not going to be relevant. Then you've got to campaign, you've got to raise awareness on the problem, and you've got to begin to convince people and turn the tide. People are with us on all these issues. And that's when we need to finish off these industries. And then, as Steve has noted, we have to have proper enforcement. It's not enough to have a law enacted. We've got to enforce the law. And in some ways, I think of Shark and, and Steve as a law enforcement organization. You know, Steve and his team are not uh, experts at legislative activity, but they're experts on the issue and they're telling us what's going on. And they're, they're guiding law enforcement to take action on these issues. And he's done that on other issues, on pigeon shooting, and he's been fighting against Mexican rodeos and the cruelty there. So Steve, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to, I just wanted to underscore that you are on the ground investigating this cruelty and you're documenting it and and you're putting up videos on on uh, Shark's website for people to see exactly what's going on. You're muted. You're muted. Yep. I was going to forget that. Even if you don't care that much about birds or animals generally, know that children are being brought to these things. Lots of kids are being brought. And the reason that the adults are bringing the kids is so that they can bring them into that disgusting web of violence and, and, and criminal activity. Children are being brought in. There's prostitution involved, drug dealing, weapons trafficking, uh, illegal gambling, of course, therefore tax evasion. There is really, this is, this is uh, cockfighting, a cockfighting pit becomes a segue where all the different criminal, all kinds of the different criminals in the area, they all come together at the cockfight pit. It, this is where, you know, maybe one guy's a thief and another guy's a drug dealer, but they all come in and they, they cross, <laughs> they, they cross learn their crimes. Uh, if, you know, some of these, uh, some of these, 
like for instance, uh, Kentucky sheriffs will say, oh, we have better things to deal with than two birds fighting. It's not two birds fighting. It's kids being drawn into criminal behavior. It's other criminals being brought together so that they become a more cohesive criminal element, a, a local mafia, if you will. There, there's, you know, nobody, if you don't care at all about animals, you still don't want cockfighting in your neighborhood. Uh, and the neighbors, especially the neighbors of these cockfight pits, it really doesn't matter where they are. They call us and they're begging for help. They, uh, they're scared to death. They're, they, you know, if they, if they utter one word of complaint, I mean, they're threatened. They, you know, I was jumped. I was nearly killed. These, these guys are killing. They're, they're getting drunk and eating junk food while they bet and laugh about birds, about animals killing each other. Okay. They don't care about life. Well, Steve, I, you know, you look back on the history of cockfighting, and these are some of the first laws that were enacted in the United States, even before you had animal welfare groups that were kind of showing the way and urging people to take action to stop organized animal cruelty. People had a sort of moral intuition that there was something deeply disturbing about people enjoying and being titillated by staged combat between animals. And this is part of the human spirit and the contradic contradictions in the human spirit. You know, I've written about this in my book, The Bond, that there's something dark in our, in our hearts where people can enjoy, and it's mostly men who enjoy watching animals kill each other. At the same time, there's another part of this human experience, which is that we're drawn to animals. And, you know, you see this conflict in our society so much cruelty, but also so much caring. You know, just a few years ago, animal protection was rated the number one cause in the United States by number of active donors and number of volunteers, exceeding breast cancer, exceeding, you know, children's health, uh, health care and hospital work, which is not to say, not to create a hierarchy about any of those moral concerns, but it's enough to say that there is an incredible, incredible presence of animal welfare in the United States. And in my many years of work on this issue, I also have traveled all over the world and I see it in people everywhere. I see it in Thailand, I see it in India, I see it in Russia, I see it in Brazil. There is something about animals that draws us. Uh, they are distinctive in their own ways, they're beautiful, they're athletic, whether they're fast or they, uh, are great climbers of trees, whatever it is, they're extraordinary. And it's in their distinctiveness that we're fascinated by them. And we do, as a species, require social interaction, right? We have to have others in order to feel whole and complete as human beings. The worst thing you can do to a prisoner is put him or her in solitary confinement. That's considered punishment because you're alone. And we need friends, we need family, we need others in our lives. And I think animals are part of this larger community of life in our world. And we get great enjoyment from them. You know, I saw Joseph, your little dog, you couldn't tell he was walking by you uh, when you were when you were offering uh, some thoughts. And we have these animals in our lives and they enrich us. And all you have to do is stare into their eyes and see that someone is home. They are, they are there. And they happen to be especially vulnerable, which makes our duty to be responsible and to care about them even more salient and more important for us. And it's the greatest expression of our humanity to be concerned about the least among us. And here we're confronted with this set of contradictions in our society, factory farming and animal fighting and horse slaughter and bear gallbladder trade or the ivory trade or whaling. And what do we do when we see this? Do we stand aside and say, oh, let's let someone else handle that? Or we say, oh, it's too tough to look at. I don't even want to think about it. Well, Steve and Carrie and Beck and, and Siri are, are standing in the breach. They said, we're not going to be bystanders any longer. We're not going to let this happen. We are going to put up resistance. It's going to be nonviolent. It's going to be through the system 
and through the channels of reform that exist in our society. And that's what we at Animal Wellness Action do. We're setting a strategic path to eliminate, eliminate these horrific practices, to stop the worst expressions of this dark part of the human spirit and to grow the best part of our humanity, our compassion, our decency, our other-centeredness, to express empathy. But again, it's these are at some level, these are just expressions. In a democratic society, in a capitalist democratic society, we have to influence the institutions that exist in our society. That's why we have to get Nike and Adidas to stop sourcing kangaroo skins and driving the slaughter of kangaroos to make athletic shoes. It's why we have to demand that the Kentucky sheriffs interdict these crimes of animal fighting in their community. It's why we're telling the Congress, let's end greyhound racing once and for all. And for the horses who help settle our country, these animals before the internal combustion engine allowed us to conduct commerce. They allowed us to travel. They allowed us to settle the country and now we're paying them back by treating them as a, as a potential slab of meat to send to the Japanese or the Chinese or the Russians. I mean, if you're just coming in from outside and see this human behavior, you're like, my God, how could these people do this? At the same time, with all that happening, I know we're going to win. I know we're going to win because we have reason, we have logic, we have science. And we have people, these small number of horse slaughterers, these small number of cockfighters, these small number of greyhound operators, they are succeeding because we haven't done enough to stop it. Now is our moment. Now is when we must, we have a chance this year in 2023 to close out three abominable industries. Let's do it. Please go to our website and take action on these issues. Send us an email. You've got Joseph's email, joseph at animalwellnessaction.org to get the alerts on this issue. Email me at wayne at animalwellnessaction.org to get alerts. Contact your lawmakers. Get your family members to do so. I'm constantly writing letters for friends and family and urging them to take action on these issues. So many people are standing aside and leaving it up to somebody else. If we have enough people, and I know that we do, to raise their voices, we can stop all of these problems. I've seen it. I've been doing it. I've been in the fortunate position to be with organizations and to have people in my universe who support this work to pass laws. In the last Congress, we got the FDA Modernization Act done to eliminate an 84-year-old mandate for animal testing for all new drugs. That mandate was driving the use of millions of animals every year. And in a two year period, we had inception of the campaign and we had delivery of a new federal law. We got the shark fin sales uh, prohibition done in the Congress. We got an anti-doping standard uh, done in the United States Congress. We got several other laws enacted. Now is this next tranche of statutes to deal with some of the big problems. Now, these are not all of the issues. We're working on a bunch of other issues. One other big farm bill issue is a new effort by the factory farming industry, specifically the pork industry, to overturn citizen ballot measures that voters overwhelmingly favor to stop the extreme confinement of farm animals on these, in these giant warehouses. And the big issue that's the controversy is the confinement of breeding sows in the pig industry. Now, these sows are conscripted into production of piglets to produce 130 million pigs a year in the United States for slaughter. Now, these pigs are as intelligent as dogs. I have met pigs. I have known pigs. Again, all you have to do is interact with them and see that someone is totally home. Now, this debate is not about whether to eat pigs or not, although that is a very legitimate and important debate. This debate is about how we treat them. 
And the precept that we're operating with is that all Americans, whether you're a, 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 a strong-minded vegan or you're an inveterate carnivore, we can all agree that if animals are gonna be raised for food and slaughtered for human appetite, that the very least we could do is not torment them. So we put them in a cage, a 400 pound or 450 pound sow in a cage that's two feet wide by seven feet long. And she's in that cage for eight, nine or 10 successive pregnancies, each one four months long. She's in there for three years immobilized, now, I mentioned we're a social being. Well, so are pigs. They're herd animals. They need to interact with others in their herd, but they're put in solitary confinement in a cage that doesn't allow them to turn around or even take a half step forward or backwards. That is so completely unacceptable as a husbandry practice. That's not the way farming's been done. You know, we domesticated animals thousands of years ago beginning 10,000 years ago. Agriculture has been conducted for millennia. We never imprisoned animals in cages and crates where they couldn't even move. That started in my lifetime, basically. It started in the 1960s. To even have this debate is remarkable. Yet there are lawmakers beholden to these factory farming interests who are carrying their water and are trying to overturn our state laws and have federal supremacy so that we have one set of rules, which is no rules at all for farm animals, because the Congress has never passed standards for care of animals on the farm. So this is a very important issue. It's called the EATS Act. It stands for Exposing Agricultural Trade Suppression. That's their formulation to wipe out our state laws that impose restraints or limits on agricultural commerce. And the restraint here is that we want the animals to be able to lie down, stand up, turn around, and freely extend their limbs. So these are immensely consequential issues. I tell my colleagues at Animal Wellness Action and the Center for Humane Economy, I said, there's nothing more important that you can do in this world than the work you're doing today. You'll never have an opportunity to affect more lives and reduce more suffering than to work on these big systematic forms of animal use and mistreatment. It's sad to say, but animals are at risk in so many different settings and so many different sectors of the economy. The only thing that's gonna stop it is you and me. So please support this work, support these organizations you heard from tonight, support Animal Wellness Action and the Center for Humane Economy financially. We need your support, but we also need your activism. We need you to raise your voices. We need you to speak to your lawmakers. We need you to write letters. We need you to recruit others. You know, my friend Randall Rowe, you know, he's been calling people today and he's been saying, oh, well, you've got to come and participate in this webinar and find out about what Animal Wellness Action and Shark and these other groups are doing. Randall, thank you so much. That's exactly what we need to be doing. Let's bring people in. And again, you know, we can enjoy life and we can have time with our families and we can enjoy time with our pets and enjoy nature. You know, I, I don't want to say everything's got to be just focus on this, but there's got to be a part of our lives where we're trying to make this world better. That is how our society has progressed. You look at the history of our country and the things that we've dealt with. We had the horrible moral crime of slavery and we denied women the right to vote. We've had civil rights problems. We have addressed these issues in our society as we should, but fairness must come to animals as well. They feel pain like we do. They are our equals, as I said at the beginning of this call in their capacity to suffer. We have the power to harm them or to help them and good people are going to help them. So let's win. And the way we win is by using the political system in an effective way and organize. So Joseph, I want to I want to thank you so much for for organizing us tonight. I want to thank Steve and Beck and Siri and Carrie and our other colleagues. And uh, let's go ahead and get active on these issues even more. I hope tonight you're inspired to take more action. All right, very good. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much. Uh, we did promise everyone who hung on that we would share our poll results. Uh, Ryan, we can explain them more fully when we send out the link, but why don't you let us know 
what the answers were. Absolutely. So for poll number one, which as a reminder was, do you think America is heading in the right direction to animal welfare? The results were yes at 3%, to some degree at 59%, not really at 19%, and no at 19% as well. All right. For the second question, which was about the state for which you live in, do you believe your state representative or state government is on the progressive side of animal welfare? 28% said yes, 28% said some degree, 22% said not really, and 22% said no. So very fascinating bit right. of data there. And for the third one, who or what do you believe is the most prominent opponent to advances in animal welfare? 48% said corporations, 22% said antiquated social norms, 23% said politicians, 7% said something else, and many in the chat said all of the above. All right. Very good. Interesting. That that gives us some ideas, maybe even for some columns um, and how to move forward with some content. So thank you, Ryan. Appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. It's it's gone long, so I won't uh, uh, drag my farewells and thanks out any longer than than to say this. Thank you. Really appreciate you. We'll send out the video, and we hope to see you on our next webinar as soon as we announce that. We'll let you know. Thanks to everyone, and good night.